Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome all the participants to this live webinar on research methods and research methodology. So we will be starting the webinar in another few minutes. So I request the participants to sit back, relax, and then enjoy today's webinar. Hope that participants had enjoyed our previous webinar sessions and it was useful for you. If in case you have any doubts, any queries or so, you can always write back to us and then we will be happy to address those issues, whatever we have. Okay, so having said that, today's webinar on uh, research methods and research methodology is being conducted by research graduate. So let me talk about uh, uh, let me give you an idea of research graduate before we start with the webinar. So we are awaiting for more participants to join and hence I will be starting the webinar shortly. Thanks for joining us. And then I think that uh, you have enjoyed our previous webinars. And so we also try to make it more eventful this webinar as well. Now, research graduate is the best PhD and master's consulting company. We cater to a large number of services to our clients, mostly who are PhD scholars or scholars, master scholars who are interested in writing their thesis or their papers or any other related aspects. We have a large number of services which we could help you help clients with. Uh, like if you want to write a topic and you're not sure what type topic you want to write, I, we could help you with topic selection. You already have the topic and you want a proposal associated with it, then we can help you with the proposal. If not, if you are, if you want review papers or, you know, research papers to be returned, we can do the bo either, both of them as well. Now, apart from that, we are also helping out um, students with writing thesis, whether it is master's or PhD thesis. If you have the entire thing ready with you in the form of thesis, we are here to help you with editing, proofreading and formatting. As the participants know or as how the participants understand, they are a wide variety of services which we offer. These are the ones which we have listed out. Sometimes you might have even queries which are not related to these but are in a different manner. Please don't hesitate about it. Please do consult us back and we will see what best we can do to, you know, satisfy and give you a satisfiable answer, which could be of help for you. So these are the most common ones which we do and hence we have put forth this, but you have even other ones which could be done as well. So <clears throat> having said that, having said that, we are. Uh, cater to a large number of services. So please write back your queries to us and we are here to help you and work it out in the best way possible. We are here to basically help clients, both international and national clients. So please don't hesitate, do write to us. So our we can be reached at email ID, which is provided here. That's info at researchgraduate.com. Or you can reach us at WhatsApp number, which is provided here. We have our website, researchgraduate.com. You can even contact us via through our website. Irrespective of the means of contact, if you have any queries, you need help at any point, please do reach to us and we are here to help you out. Now, so we are always interested here to look for the kind of queries you provide us and see how best we can, you know, answer your queries. May it be any of them relevant to PhD, master's or paper writing. Please do feel free to contact us at any of the given ones and then we are here to help you out. So having said that, I welcome all the participants. A warm good afternoon to all the participants who have joined us. So we hope that you enjoyed our previous webinars and they were, you know, quite fruitful for you in terms of knowledge that you could gain. So we are here again to talk about research methods and research methodology. So let us now start with the webinar officially. 
So let us start with the webinar. Today's webinar is titled Research Methods and Research Methodology. We will try to tell you exactly what is research methodology and what's its importance, what are methods, what is the difference between the research methodology and research methods. That also we will be elaborating out because many a times participants get confused between what is what. So before I start with the whole webinar, these are the contents which we will be covering out. First, we will elaborate a bit on what is research? What are the characteristics of research? How do you classify a research as a good research? And why do you even write research? Why do you even do research? We will elaborate a bit on it because if you don't understand this, we can't enter into understand about research methods and research methodology. So we will work out on it a bit and then we will proceed ahead to talk about research methods. What are the various types of research methods you have, which is qualitative, quantitative and mixed research. Then we come to research methodology and its significance. Once we talk about it, then we come to come, we put in a comparison for what's the difference between research methods and research methodology. How is that you go about or go ahead with it and you demarcate both of them? Then there are different aspects associated with research methodology, which include the measurement objectives, the data collection process, recommended survey and reporting plan. So we talk about all of this in detail. So we then say how to explain the research methodology, meaning how do you write it? What's a methodological approach? What is the methods for data collection analysis? and ethical considerations. How do you evaluate and justify your choices? What are the kinds of hypotheses that are proposed and how you go about working with them? What are the frequently asked questions about methodology and the tips for writing a strong methodology we shall cover in the end of the webinar. Now, uh, let me uh, tell all the participants that, that we have a live question answer session at the end of the webinar. So please don't worry about it. You just focus on the webinar. At the end of it, we will answer all your questions as much as possible. And today's webinar is more generalized and I wouldn't be like, you know, taking too many of what do you call examples, but I will try to give you a generalized aspect. And in many cases, the examples come up are from market research or any of the generalized ones. I'm not going to take very specific examples because this is a generalized topic that we are covering today. So let us then start with our, you know, the prop webinar. So what is research exactly? Now research, as it is said, is a systematic investigation of a specific observation using scientific methods. As it is said here, it's a careful consideration of a study regarding a particular concern or a problem using scientific methods. So you have an observation from where you make a problem, you study it in a highly scientific manner. It is a systematic inquiry which involves describing the process, explaining the process, predicting the outcome of the process and, uh, and identifying how to control and observe a given phenomena. So if you can vary it, how do you vary it and how you get it done? It, it involves two of the methods called inductive and deductive methods. When I say inductive methods, it's more qualitative, meaning you are analyzing an already observed event. Deductive is quantitative where you are trying to make the event or phenomena and see what you get. Inductive approaches are with qualitative research and deductive methods are with quantitative analysis, which is aptly written here. So it depends on what exactly are you trying to do and how you are trying to do it out. Then research begins by asking a question. So first you collect the material, you choose an appropriate method for detect deducting it, but first you need the question. So you ask an appropriate question. And after asking the question, you try to go in and investigate what is the method by which we can address this question. 
After you collect the answers to the questions, you analyze all your findings, you draw observations and conclusions, and then you come out whether is that a feasible answer that you have got to the existing thing or is it not. So first you ask the question. Once you ask the question, you analyze it thoroughly. Then you draw conclusions based on the analysis and then you come back to the question and then you ask whether have you answered the question or have you not answered the question. That is what exactly comes in the hypothesis part, which we discuss much later in the slides as such. Now, what uh, research covers the research whoever does either qualitative quantitative it's irrespective of the nature of the research that is done there is a purpose for which we do it for example here what has been put forth is for market research if you are trying to analyze that you have provided a particular drug in the market whether the drug is working or not then you have to identify so many aspects with it first you want to identify who are the customers who are using the drugs. Are they the ones who are already existing customers you have who have used it or they are new customers? Then what is the purpose of doing this? You are releasing the drug in the market and you want customers to use it. What is the purpose? Are you looking specifically that there is a, a, what you call the index for utilization? Or are you looking for any other aspect? So you have to set pragmatic goals. What is the goal that you are looking at and how you want to do it out? Then one of the purpose of the research includes a productive market strategy, which means you have to do an effective strategy such that people buy the drug. Otherwise, it will not make any sense. How do you address the business challenges? If already competitor drugs exist for the related thing, then how will you make your product better than them and how will you get it out? How do you put forth a business expansion plan? For example, you already have the drug in market and you find it's going well, customers are buying it. Then in that case, how do you expand it so that it goes for a much larger geographical region and then you get out more business out of it what are the new opportunities that arise out of it so whenever a research is done the research is not just done because you want to do it but there is a purpose which fits with any one of the goals which is proposed here and it is based on this is what you do research exactly then here is a schematic which shows for the same thing you have research so first you define your problem and then you identify the characteristics associated with the problem. Then you identify whether you wish to do a quantitative research or a qualitative research. Then you come out with examples from the literature which support you and then you work it out. So this is a, like a five-fold strategy which ideally defines what is research and how you do it out. And these are the ones which I have even have covered in the earlier slides and which do make sense in that way. So defining, characterizing, identifying the nature of results, research, and then picking up examples appropriately and working it out. These are the synonymous features which are associated with the research, which cannot be neglected at any time. So if you do not have any of them fixed with you, then you can't do research properly and hence it becomes important. Having said that, what are the qualities of good research? How do you identify that the research that is done is a good one? Now, good research has certain basic features which helps us to identify. One, it's a systematic approach to capture accurate data. So when you look at the research data and its conclusion and analysis, it should look logical and systematic. There should be a flow in the way it has been done. There is ethics and code of conduct which needs to be followed by researchers. In any specific field, it's important that you stick to the ethics and code of conduct and you work it out accordingly. Then the analysis always is based on logical reasoning and it has both inductive and deductive methods used, meaning you use both the existing literature and we also do your work and combine both of them and give the logical reasoning. 
So when you are doing inductive methods and you are framing your hypothesis based on it, that gives an indication that as a researcher, you are going through real time data and means you're going through data and you are trying to get knowledge of the data. So it tells you how knowledgeable you are in a given field. And then the in-depth analysis of data collected will also tell you that there are no abnormalities or anormal anomalies associated with it, meaning that the data once collected and done is pretty clear and that there is no need to worry about the validity and, you know, authenticity of the data per se. So these are some of the aspects which are associated with good research, which have to be done. Then other features which are associated with good research include it is not just doing the research per se as such but once if you have done the research you create a path for generating new questions the research should lead to more questions it should lead to have a definitive future plan so that others can work on now the existing data should help future or other researchers to have more opportunities to work on and go about with it. Now, so the way you analyze the data is important and the analysis of data should be in such a way that there is no ambiguity in inferring the data. Accuracy and credibility is the most important aspect of any good research. If it is not accurate, then it is not reproducible. Then in that case, you are in trouble because if you can't reproduce it, then you don't know how to work out with it. For example, in a lab, when you do experimental research, you use a large number of instruments for collecting the data. The instruments need to be accurate and they have to be calibrated. If they are not calibrated and accurate, then it will affect your whole experiment and so your whole research. And hence, such minuscule details have to be considered and are important, though they look as though they are not very important. At the end of it, when you generate the data and you write the methodology, it will create a lot of problem and your research might as well become invalid if in case you don't follow any of these aspects. Now, so having said that, these are the characteristics of a good research. As it is said, one, it originates with a question or a problem. So there is a definitive question which is followed. There is a definitive problem that is being <coughs> addressed as such. Then it requires clear articulation of a goal, meaning you have to write very clearly what is the research objective, what is the goal that you want to have and how you are going with it. Then it follows a specific plan or a procedure. There is a blueprint of how you have done the research, which is nothing but methodology. The main problem that you pr propose has to be divided into multiple sub problems and you have to explain how you deal with each of them. A good research often has a proper question which is asked, a specific problem that's expressed and a hypothesis. And at the end of the research, you mention whether the hypothesis is met or it is not met. It accepts certain critical assumptions. The assumptions are based on the problem posed or the question asked. Now you have to have a very systematic method for collecting and interpreting data. And then research is cyclical or helical in nature, meaning you do the research, you get out with an answer. Again, from the answer, you get a new question and then you start a fresh research again. So it's a never ending cycle of questions and answers. But one question often leads to a definitive answer from where you get multiple questions which you can address. So that's a good research has all these features which play an important role and which work out to be far more important than what is expected. So. Uh, let me tell you to all the participants that because most of you are interested in, you know, doing PhDs or in publishing papers and others, the research should be of high quality. Only if and if the research is of high quality that you have issues which can be sorted out and which could be worked out very easily as such. Now, there are three main purposes of research, which include one exploratory. When I say exploratory, the name itself suggests you want to explore. 
So you have a large set of data already available or there are a group of questions which are available and you are trying to look found, look down for answers for that in the form of an exploratory study. The answers and analytics may not offer a conclusion to the perceived problem, though they don't give you a definitive answer, but they tell you what is the outline you get from your study and if this outline can be further carried out to give specific answers later. Usually, when you have new problems or new areas which have to be researched, you first do a short scale, that's an exploratory research to see even if it is worth jumping into that area and further diving in to do the research. The exploratory research lays the foundation for more conclusive data collection and analysis. Thus, exploratory research is like the first step of any of the research process. You explore you investigate, you publish. Now that's how it goes. Then you have descriptive research. When I say descriptive research, this will be like usually the next step. It focuses on expanding the knowledge on current issues through a process of data collection. So descriptive research describes the behavior of a sample population. So here you're collecting, trying to collect data based on some observation which you got from exploratory research and you're trying to describe it. So as it is said here, the three main aims of descriptive studies are to describe, to explain and to validate. This mostly could be qualitative research and not quantitative because numbers might not play an important role, but you look for overall patterns that you have to do and how you get it going. So that helps you to understand very easily as how the things are going on and how they are working out. So the three primary purposes of descriptive study are describing, explaining and validating the findings, which explain the whole descriptive research as that. Then you come to explanatory research. Explanatory research, when you say, it includes, it's like a casual research, wherein which you pick up the problem you look at both uh, exploratory and descriptive and then you further go ahead for standardizing procedures to study the problem. Now running experiments is the most popular form by which you do this kind of research. For example, uh, there is a study which talks about conducting the effect of rebranding on customer royalty. So loyalty, sorry, customer loyalty means you already have a brand and you have defined the number of customers who are using it. But now you have, you know, modified the brand. So you want to check out if it works out properly or if it doesn't work out properly. So you go back to that set of existing customers, you give your brand and then you take a survey as if it is good or not. You give it to new customers and see how it is working out. So you are running an experiment here to see if the existing brand upon modification, does it have effect on customers or not? So that that is what is the hypothesis we framed already. And so we work out on it and then we try to conclude based on it. And thus you get out what is called as a real answer for your question. And so it will be very useful in such a way and will be helpful as such also. Now, here are the three kinds of research that you have, and that is the way it is. Now, on one on the top, you have exploratory, descriptive, and explanatory, and the parameters you are looking are put onto the left. The research approach used in exploratory research is unstructured, meaning you are looking at random aspects. There is no definitive structure because there is no definitive question. You start with a vague question and you start collecting out things. In descriptive and explanatory research, they are structured. For explanatory, it's highly structured. So, no, sorry, for descriptive, uh, explanatory, it's highly structured uh, as such. So you start with unstructured, then you're going to structured, then you're coming to highly structured. So then the research, whatever you conduct, is by asking questions for all, both of them, exploratory and descriptive. Whereas for explanatory research, it's by framing a hypothesis. And when do you conduct this kind of research? Now, as aptly it is shown here, when you are making some decision to start on a kind of a work, you do exploratory. Then you are trying to decide how to go about with it. Then you do descriptive. And finally, we have a question which needs to be answered. You do 
then you finally do the explanatory research as such. So that's exploratory research is like for beginners. Then descriptive research is for intermediate researchers and explanatory is for PhD students. So it could go like bachelor's to master's to PhD. And that's how it's like analogous to that exploratory to descriptive to explanatory research. Then here is an example which explains the purpose of the business research very clearly. You do the research, you market it, and then you try to look for new customers who could come in. Who are they? How they are? You try to collect consumer insights for the product that you have supplied. Well, who are the consumers whom, who are con taking your product? So you are trying to collect precise consumer targets. What is the advantage of the product that you have launched in the market over its competitors? Then the relevant industrial information is how much it takes to work out with, how we can produce it and how we go about with it. And then the demographics. So if you are going to work in a smaller area, it's very successful. If you want to expand the whole area and see, then how does it work out? This is like a multi-thronged strategy or multi-fold strategy of addressing so many questions in one market research. And hence, when you combine all of this, you go with the future directions and you work it out. Now, as I said, research process is a cyclical, as you can see here. First, you have a design. Once you have a design for the study, you go ahead and you work with the design. You conduct the study, then you analyze the data, you draft the article, submit the publication, you peer review, then article is finally published. Once the article is published or thesis is published, that offshoots a large number of questions. And so from where you get a new research and again, you design a study. So this wheel of you know research is never ending. You get with a study, you publish it as a thesis or an article. Again, you start with a new study inspired from the thesis or article published and you go ahead with it. And that's how the research process goes. That's the cyclical wheel of research, which always happens out. So having said it, we have introduced sufficient enough to research and the purpose of the research. Let us move on to what are research methods and how you do them. Now, research methods are classified into two kinds mainly. It's a qualitative research and quantitative research. In both the cases, you collect data, but the way you collect data is different. Now, qualitative research includes asking open-ended questions. Open-ended questions, meaning questions are broad. They are not clo close-ended, unlike for quantitative, where the question is very definitive. Here, the question is broad, and hence, you can't, you know, hypothesize and confirm it. Then you do the quantitative for that. The responses in case of qualitative methods are non-numerical, meaning the numbers and statistics do not play an important role. You just try to collect the opinion from the participants and based on the opinion obtained, you go ahead and you work it out. So you are trying to look, for example, a, a simple question as like, why did you feel like having ice cream today? So then it's not a question of how many participants had the ice cream, but it's a question of why participants had the ice cream. So you collect answer for that and you try to judge based on it. And so that becomes a proper qualitative method for research. Now, there are different kinds of qualitative methods which are followed, which includes one to one interview focus groups, ethnographic studies, text analysis, and case studies. These are the most common ones which are researched and which are used at. This is what is summarized here. If you can see here, these are the methods. So you can have one-to-one -one interview. As it says, it's face-to-face. -face. You sit one person to one and discuss it out. Focus groups are like more oriented where you group people and you do it. Ethnographical research is more based on cultural aspects and cultural traditions and then you work out on it. Then process observation, meaning you observe the whole thing and then you try to make out conclusions from it. Record keeping and case study research. We will discuss them a bit in the next slides as such. And so all of these are the ones which you work out and which you get them done. 
Now, one-to-one interview, this involves direct, direct interviewing of the volunteer by the research group, as, it, as the name itself suggests. They include audio recordings of the interview. You collect the audios, then you try to grade them based on the audios. So the grading is done based on the volunteer uh, uh, assessment, based on the volunteer response. So you uh, later on play the audios and you have a scale of grading the volunteers based on how they have answered. You go ahead, you record it and you then work it out in the same fashion. Then. Yes, so as it is said, focus groups, they involve discussion with a group of people. Now, who are this group of people? This group of people are interrelated. Say, for example, I'm working out with the effect of a drug which tries to cure malaria. Then I try to collect all the participants who have been treated with this drug. So it forms a specific group. That particular group you discuss with, then it's a focus group discussion or FGD. They are direct discussions and interviews with the related people. It is similar to one-to-one -one interview because you do audio recordings and then you do gradings later. Now, focus group discussions are very useful and done when you have a large group to study. Now, if the group is too big, then you can't do one to one interview, then you do focus groups and try to get out as how, uh, you know, how to grade the responses in a faster manner to see if the effect of the drug is working on malarial cure. Case study research involves a, it's an in-depth study of either a single case or multiple related cases. It could go single or multiple, it doesn't matter. In case of medical research, case study research is very widely used. You take a specific case which is pertaining to an infection or cases which are suffering with specific problems. So case study could be a single individual, multiple individuals or an organization per se. So the case study research in that way varies. It could be you can take the whole organization as one unit and you can do it or you can take a single individual or multiple individuals who are related like focus group and you can do. But here they are all related to a specific case and you are only working out with it. So that is where case study research becomes very important. Then. Having said that about qualitative methods, then let us come to quantitative methods. As the name itself suggests, these are quantitative, meaning you have quantity, you have numericals, you have numbers here, the data is analyzed and the data is worked out. It is It uses a systematic way of investigating events or data, which is the major difference from qualitative and quantitative ones. Now, it tries to answer questions, but here in quantitative research, you have hypothesis and you try to look at the dependency of one variable with other then you explain predict or control the phenomena based on the interreaction and interrelation between the variables there are types of quantitative methods which include survey research descriptive research and correlational research we will speak about them a bit here and then again in the later slides we have more details when we come to how to write them and how you do it out now, as aptly put forth here, when you are talking about numericals, data collecting and statistical analysis, there are certain aspects which have to be considered, which includes validity, accuracy and reliability of data. Now, that is something which is very, very important to be considered, though this holds good for qualitative research also, but it is more apt for quantitative research here. These are the um, various points considered. It's essential that to ensure that your data is valid, meaning there is a logic to it. The data uh, is logical. It is impartial, meaning there is no biasness in the data and it has a solid background or it is founded. And accuracy, it is free of errors and anybody who picks up this data can accurately replicate it elsewhere. And that also comes with reliability that other people who investigate in the same way can use your work as well. Then it is timely, meaning it is collected and analyzed in appropriate time frames, wherein which the time frames are for few months or years and it's reproducible.
and it is complete meaning it includes all the data that is required for your business decisions to be taken it is not just done that you only have the desired data but broader implications of the data and if strategy makers want to you know confirm it then they also have data that's required for it as such then here is how is the difference between qualitative and quantitative methods one is based on the concept when you come to the conceptual uh, thinking of qualitative part it's concerned with understanding human behavior we are not interested in how many humans are responding to that specific aspect but we are interested in why the particular participant thinks in this way so that's where is the qualitative aspect it assumes a dynamic and negotiated reality which is so aptly said meaning it's a, it's sort of a live one where in which you're speaking with the participants and so the dynamics of analysis change with every participant in case of quantitative ones it is concerned with you know reanalyzing the obtained observation and trying to replicate that here you don't have live dynamics you have a fixed and measurable reality so you have variables you are trying to look at the variables how they work out and you try to measure the feasibility of that phenomena so you are no longer with the participants there you have come to the lab to do the work then what is the methodological approach data is collected through participant observations and interviews you collect the data you sit and you analyze it and you try to observe patterns and themes which are arising out of it and the data is reported mostly in the way or in the language the way of informant as how he wants whereas in case of quantitative research data is collected by measuring things you use instruments for measurement and you work it out you then do statistical comparisons and you try to say whether the data is feasible or not feasible and the final statistical outputs which are significant are the ones which are only put forth and which are worked out now this is how is uh, broadly to show this is how is survey research so when you talk of survey research here you talk of online market research survey in which you are looking at a product whose cost in the market how much it is then how much accessibility is and how convenient it is this is one of the examples for the survey research which i have put forth so that it's easy to understand the cost convenience and accessibility so you make uh, analysis for the qualitative analysis means you make a quantitative analysis for this and then you come out with conclusions based on it then you have uh, descriptive research so when you have the descriptive research it goes right from defining the problem to what are the characteristics associated with the research and what kind of applications you can have for the research then you come to methods examples and advantages which you work out and you show how it works out with and how you get it done so that's another dis, uh, distinctive part you have and correlational research when i say correlational research as the name itself suggests it is to correlate the effect of one variable over other that is what you are trying to do here you are investigating the possibility of relationships between any two variables however these two variables might not be related at all but it doesn't matter you just try to research it to see if they are related or they are not related so of the several variables you fix all other variables and only use these two variables descriptive research it's a, it's correlation is a kind of descriptive research because it describes the existing relationship between variables say in uh, literature you might already have that there is yes exactly a correlation between the two or not there but you don't look up at all that you just go ahead you do it and you reconfirm the existing fact then it becomes correlational research as such now having said that we come to mixed methods or mixed research what exactly is mixed research you have qualitative and you have quantitative when you are mixing them together it becomes mixed methods now it here is the exploratory mixed methods design you can go in any ways depends on the work you are doing you first do a quantitative data collection then you do a quantitative data analysis based on these results you do interviews and then you do qualitative half 
like data collection and analysis. Then you come back to the question which is raised here and then you confirm it. In this process, you are mixing both of them and you are trying to explain how you have done. So it becomes a mixed research. As it is said here, the mixed research utilizes both qualitative and quantitative methods in combination for analysis. Usually, the qualitative data is you in most of the cases first you do the qualitative methods and you get out with a question that question is uh, it goes for quantitative research and you answer the question for example what i have put forth here is when you do large scale genomic studies in a population you are trying to look for if there is a genetic disorder in a given population and you have hints which are existing that it is so you what you do here is metagenomic analysis is performed first which is bioinformatic in nature and that's mostly like qualitative which tells yes such a pattern exists once you know that such a kind of a pattern exists and it is there then you proceed ahead and do qualitative analysis here you use a small set or a large set of population and you analyze in detail using the appropriate experiments that yes in fact it does exist so that's how the mixed research goes and that's how mixed research is done usually one leads to other whether it's a quantitative which leads to qualitative or qualitative which leads to quantitative it is irrespective of it Having said that, that is a bit about the methods which we do and how we work it out. We will come now to what is research methodology. Now, research methodology, let me tell you all the participants who have joined here today, methodology is not methods. Methods is a part of methodology. A methodology is a systematic way by which you explain how you have done your research. You justify how you did it. It provides an interpretation of data gathered and drawing conclusions about the research data. No doubt it has methods in it, but it's not exclusively methods as such. Essentially, the definition for research methodology is given like this. It's the analysis of principles of methods, rules and postulates employed by a specific discipline as aptly said, or it's a systematic study of methods that are, can be, or have been applied within a discipline, or it's a study or description of methods. As uh, almost most of the times we say, methodology is a blueprint of your study. When somebody reads the methodology, he understands what was the research you tried to do, how you tried to do it, how you analyze the data, and how you got out the observation. So in one shot, you give a blueprint which justifies that the research that you have done is accurate and is correct as such. So that is how is research methodology. Then, now this is the explanation for the research methodology. It's a plan and structure of investigation in order to obtain evidence to answer the research question. That's what is called the blueprint. Research methodology involves, you explain how you choose the subject, you explain how you collected the data, what are the tools you have used for collecting, what is the procedure you have followed, what are the various steps involved in collecting the data, then how you did the data analysis, the techniques and tools used here, then the procedures and steps for analyzing the data. These are all the various aspects which are covered and clubbed in research methodology and which are worked out with. So thus, research methodology in a way becomes distinct from methods because methods will only just include explaining the data collection and data analysis. But the remaining parts for justification is never provided in the methods as say. Now, what is the significance of research methodology? Why exactly should someone write research methodology? Research methodology is the one of the most important parts for a thesis or for a paper. Paper doesn't have a specific methodology part, but it comes with methods itself as such. Now, methodology will explain the path. It's very important when you do thesis. Methodology explains the path. Choosing a wholly suitable and sound method that is right for your research justifies a lot as why you do, did it and how you succeeded in doing it. The study of research methodology gives necessary training to explain 
the methods, materials, tools, and training techniques that have been used for the relevant problem. So you, in short, you are trying to give the whole idea of how you have done it and you are trying to justify it. So that is not very easy to do and it takes a lot of time to do that. So that's how you, that is the significance of research methodology whenever you write it. And that's what has been shown here. It offers readers the opportunity to know how the data was generated. So not just writing the methods, but because the methods is a part of it, when the reader goes through methodology, it gives him an idea. OK, this is how he has generated the data. These are the things which he has followed. It justifies why a particular procedure was followed, not the other one. Though you don't put comparison between the procedures here, but it, it gives a justification why only that procedure has not been followed and not others. It allows, it allows other researchers in the field to adopt and follow a similar model and see if that has been replicatable and if they get data similar to it or they get data not similar to it. Then. The readers want to know uh, that the data was collected or generated in a way that is consistent with the protocols in the field, meaning has the data been done with following the moral and ethical standards? If it has been done with moral and ethical standards, then we go ahead with it and we get it done. So readers can evaluate that and tell that whether the ethical conduct exists or not. That's why research methodology is important. Then, what are research methods? Now, uh, research method pertains to all those methods which the re employ a researcher employs in order to collect the data, in order to analyze the data, and to solve the given problem. Now, the techniques and procedures that are applied during the course of studying research problem is what is known as research method. So, it summarizes so many things like if you have qualitative and quantitative methods then you talk of surveys case studies interviews questionnaires observations and so many other aspects so the methods has to explain all of them all the instruments which have been used for explaining and understanding the various aspects have to be explained then you have to tell how you have collected the data how you have processed the data and how you have drawn inferences and made decisions based on it. So research methods in general per se cover all these various aspects and then they work it out. So thus research methods is more explaining the process per se. Now there are different kinds of categories in which research methods fall. First, first category, the methods relating to data collection are covered, meaning how did you collect the data? What are the various methods that you have used? Such methods are used when existing data is not sufficient to reach the solution, which means you have already used a specific set of methods, but you are not able to reach a specific solution. Then you explain in detail how you have done it and how you have worked it out. Then the second category is how you have analyzed the data. You already got the data. How did you analyze it out? Then third category comprises of methods which describe how the accuracy and validity of data has been checked. Okay, I have data with me now. Whether the data is accurate, can it be presented, can it be published? So you go for it and then you talk about it in the third category as such. Then, now this is the similarities and differences between research methods versus methodologies. Research methods may be understood as all those methods or techniques that are used for conducting the research. On other hand, research methodology is a systematic blueprint which explains the logic that has been used to understand your, the question that has been posed for research and how it is solved scientifically. Research methodology has many dimensions and methods just constitute a part of the methodology. The scope of research methodology is wider than that of research methods. And this is where the participants have to understand that it is clear cut different. This is the difference between methods versus methodology. Now, if you compare it here, research methods is more like explaining the, you know, 
what you think in your brain as how you are doing it. It is just the selection and construction of research technique. Whereas research methodologies like the mainframe computer, wherein which you are doing everything, including methods and all other aspects. It is the science of understanding how research is performed methodic methodologically. And hence is the difference between research methods and research methodology. Now, Having said that, let us now come to research methodology. What are the various aspects which you cover in methodology? How you go about with it? And then we come and talk about each of them as how you write them and how you ensure that it is followed in a proper manner. So first aspect covered in methodology is measurement objectives. Now the measurement objectives answer the why of the research question. Like why exactly have you done the measurements? What is the necessity to do? So you give appropriate justification for it. You give justification as why you have measured it. What are the outcomes expected from the measurement? Now it should be clear and concise. Explain each of the measurement objectives in detail. Be precise. Don't leave any room for any error so that the people can think that you have not done it properly as such. So that's where it becomes important. Then data collection is another aspect that you have. Data collection methodology covers the logistics as how you have done the research. It determines and explains how the data was supposed to be collected and how we have collected it. If you have multiple data collection sources, then you give the logic for each of them and you explain how you have collected for each of them. And then you tell how you have integrated the whole thing together to make it a big picture. Now, it also gives the pros and cons of each data collection. Like if there are any negative aspects associated, then you that also you mention. Or if there are any limitations associated with it, that also you mention clearly so that the reader understands the complete aspect of the pros and cons associated with the whole data collection process. Then you come to survey. Now, when we say survey, you are putting questions here and you are trying to say it. So you have framed the research objectives already when you make the question. So survey should be expressing those research objectives and must be trying to answer those. Make a distinct connection between every survey question and the research objective. Now, don't ask questions which are not related to the research objective because you are trying to do it in a specific manner and trying to understand irrespective of whether it's qualitative research or quantitative research as such. So having said that, then we come to reporting plan. So how do you report it? What are the methods that you have followed for reporting these data? Are you using PowerPoints, Excels, Word documents? How are you doing it out? Now, how long the report will be? That also has to be mentioned in the methodology. And what exactly does the report contain? What exactly does the report answer? This is also important. Prepare a timeline with milestones so that everyone knows what to expect. What are the deliverables from the research? So research methodology will give you the expected outcomes. So you have to mention what are those deliverables or expected outcomes which are coming out. Designing the research methodology is the most important phase of any research because it's a blueprint of the study. And this is the blueprint which everyone follows and tries to evaluate. The research methodology has everything that everyone needs to know about conducting the project. It is presented in such a way that it is easy for everyone to understand. If you need to add references inside them, please go ahead and put it so that it becomes concise and clear as such. Now, here is the difference between quantitative and qualitative research. Quantitative research is highly structured data. You do statistical analysis, you have hypothesis, you do surveys, you do experiments and see if you're meeting the hypothesis. Whereas qualitative research is unstructured data. It's just a summary. There is no statistical analysis. It's only interviews, focus groups and observations which are summarized as such. So. Uh, when you are framing research methodology for both of them, it will be differing based on the aspects associated with each of the research. Now, 
Here are the aspects to be considered for framing methodology for quantitative and qualitative methods. One, quantitative data that is not numerical and it's analyzed and quantified, but it's not, it's like you give the basic facts. You don't give accurate facts. In a case of uh, qualitative, in case of quantitative, the data is highly numerical and you can quantify it and statistically measure and do the quantification. The collection method includes open-ended survey questions, which are unstructured for qualitative. You have focus groups, observations, and more. But as for quantitative, it's in person. You, you do like for in person or online or in person and phone interviews or surveys, but these are more associated with close end questions where you know what the question you are asking and you're expecting a definitive answer there. Now, qualitative kind of methodologies are best for formulating hypothesis and to gather a pattern which arises out from large groups of study. Whereas quantitative are good for conclusions and they are good for conducting statistical analysis on large groups or large populations, so-called cohorts and get out definitive answers. The analysis that you do in qualitative is manual. You don't use any statistical in quantitative, it is statistical analysis with charts, tables, and programs. Now, example here I can give you example is for qualitative as why did you buy ice cream today? Now, that's personal experience as why you got it. In quantitative, did you buy ice cream today? Is it a yes or is it a no? We don't look at the personal uh, experiences as why he didn't buy it. We look for a yes or no because you are trying to frame based on it. And as it is said here, for qualitative, the answer usually is like, I saw ice cream on sale by checkout and it was an impulse buy. I wanted to treat myself. Now, that's a personal thing. But as for quantitative, 67% of respondents brought ice cream today. See the difference between both of them. Qualitative is more like non-organized, whereas quantitative is highly organized as such. Then the then that gets us to jump on for qualitative research and how we proceed ahead to do qualitative research. Now, the methodology followed for qualitative research, the approach that you follow varies. There are different approaches that you have. The first approach is grounded theory, meaning you have you collect a lot of data and you develop theory based on the existing data. That's called grounded theory, ethnography. It's based on the cultural aspects. You are trying to understand the cultures that are associated with it. And so when you are trying to understand the cultures and the way they work it out, you go ahead and you do ethnography. Then you have action research, meaning researchers and participants collaboratively link together to drive social changes. Like, for example, in this case, like you want to plan, uh, you want to seed plants and make a ecologically green zones. Uh, then the researcher will coordinate with participants and you uh, seed the plants. That becomes action research. Phenomenological research, where you are trying to look for traits or phenomena which is being experienced in life by the participants. So research gets investigate a phenomena. They try to describe and interpret based on the experiences of the participant. The narrative research. Here it is like how you do stories, narrate. You narrate them out and you work it out. You're told to understand how participants perceive and make sense of their experiences. These are different kinds of approaches which are used while making methodology and while describing them, which is what is summarized here. These are the research methods you have. Grounded theory, action, phenomenological, narrative, and ethnographic research. Now, Qualitative research methods. So that are the approaches which are followed for the methodology. And when you come to research methods, you are trying to collect data here. There are different ways by which you can do it. First method is by observations. So you record them, you analyze them, you hear them. Sometimes you record somewhere where the participant is not live, but you know it's going on related to your work. So recording of what you have seen, heard or encountered in detail. Then interviews, personally asking people to do one-to-one -one conversations. Focus group is asking questions and generating discussions among group of people. 
then surveys you distribute questionnaires you collect them and you evaluate them based on open ended questions then secondary research you collect the existing data in the form of text images audios or video recordings and then you go ahead and try to say as how it has been working out now that is one, these are the various aspects which you have here that's what has been put forth here for the data collection you do interviews you do surveys you do group discussions you do observations and then you reach for conclusions based on these then having said it the qualitative research methods we continue a bit more with it when the qualitative research is done by the researcher unlike quantitative the researcher himself is the instrument so he is the one who takes all the observations he interprets it and he analyzes it for this reason when the qualitative research methodology is written it has to be written very carefully because your approach and the way you deduce is completely dependent on the viewpoint of the researcher since it is dependent upon the viewpoint of the researcher it is not possible that you can go ahead and further say anything so it needs to be unbiased and written properly as such then qualitative data analysis so when you are doing the data analysis you have data in the form of text photos videos and audios for example you have collected transcripts interview transcripts survey responses field notes or recordings from natural settings so you sit with all of them you try to analyze as how it is going and what is happening then most types of qualitative data analysis share five common steps which include prepare and organize your data so you have all the transcripts first put all the transcripts together organize the transcripts in such a way that they are headings and subheadings for it and then you prepare your data so first go through a preliminary analysis of the data then you review and explore your data which means you are trying to look for patterns or repeated ideas that emerge from data so you listen to the recordings you reread the transcripts and try to analyze what kind of a pattern is that you are evolving out then you develop a data coding system this is important because if you are you know repeatedly interviewing the same person for multiple aspects then you data code that person you give a code to that person and you put the whole transcripts and entire analysis in that then you assign codes to the data so you first make coding system in which you put folders and subfolders with names you assign codes to those you can even give barcodes and keep them so that the data becomes completely authentic you supply the barcodes and people can work out so in a qualitative survey analysis this may mean going through each participant's responses and tagging them with codes in a spreadsheet as you go through your data you can create new codes to add to your system if necessary then identifying the recurring themes <clears throat> is there a reoccurring theme which is happening so is it true that across the various participants you find the same thing these are the five classical features associated with qualitative data analysis <clears throat> then <clears throat> There are several specific approaches to analyze qualitative data. Although these method methods share similar processes, but they have they are working out on different concepts of the same data and related aspects. Now, here are the various qualitative data analysis methods that you have. One is content analysis. When you say content analysis, when do you use it? It is used to describe and categorize common words, phrases, and ideas in qualitative data. For example, a market researcher could perform content analysis to find out what kind of language is used in descriptions of therapeutic apps. it's it's very clear we don't need further explanation but to in order to understand that you have to do content analysis thematic analysis is for identification of recurrent themes or patterns a psychologist could apply thematic analysis to travel blogs to explore how travel affects the psychology or the self identity of the per traveler or person textual analysis that is to examine the content structure and design of texts a media researcher could use textual analysis to understand how news coverage of celebrities has changed in the past decade 
So there you do a lot of text and then you try to analyze it. Disclosure analysis is where it's mostly useful in communication and political sciences. You do come, you do like uh, you give a speech and then you see how it affects the population in a specific context and then you disclose out the data. A political scientist could use disclosure analysis to study how politicians generate trust in election campaigns. These are the various analytical methods followed in qualitative data applicable to any, any field or to any stream and hence that could be very useful as such. That gets us to what is called as ethical issues in qualitative, uh, what you call research. So always you have ethical issues, irrespective of uh, qualitative or it is quantitative. Researchers must state, researchers must state values and biases in writing re reports, which is very important because irrespective, it is not, though it is not quantitative, but still it has code of conduct to be followed. Researchers must take, take steps to ensure that accurate account of participant perceptions are returned. It, he should not involve his concepts there. It should be purely participants. They have a responsibility to use data to enhance social change. So they have to be very careful because whatever is published based on a survey from people will change the way people think. So you have to be very careful. Informed consent has to be obtained from all the participants and participants usually are equal authors in the study because it's based on them. Consent is sometimes obtained through personal interaction with individuals or communities because you need trust to publish it. They can be viewed as partners in the research process and always as social equal of a researcher. Though you don't put the names of participants, but without them, you, it doesn't go. So it has to be important to rightly acknowledge them. Then, having said that, now informed consent is one thing which is important. Participants must understand what the study will involve and must agree to participate. It should pa protect participants from harm, like whatever questions you raise, whatever follow up you do, that and all has to be confidential and it should not come ha cause harm to the participants. Anonymity and confidentiality are the most important feature. It should be fully anonymous. Participant details should not be leaked or should not be given to anyone. Research material should be destroyed and transcript anonymous. Destroyed not in the sense that it has to be, it means that it can't be kept in public databases. It should be, sub, uh, what do you call, documented or given to a appropriate database which is required and you keep informed consent of that to the participant. Now that is how is the methodology for qualitative research. Having said it, we will come now to the methodology that is followed for quantitative research. Now Prime, they are different kinds of quantitative research, which includes primary and secondary quantitative research. First, we'll talk about the primary one. Primary quantitative research is the most widely used method for conducting research. Now, the primary quantitative research design is broken down into several types as, mentioned, as shown in the slide here. They include survey research, correlational research, casual comparative research, and experimental research as such. So we will be discussing all these in detail uh, as how it is required. So first we'll come to survey research. It is the most fundamental kind of research which is done. So you have tools for doing, you know, surveying people. You then have numericals associated with it and it will have a quantitative outcome. Now, surveys usually include questionnaires, they could be online polls, online surveys, or paper questionnaires, or web intercept surveys. It could be any of them. This type of research can be conducted targeting a specific audience group and also can be conducted across multiple groups. It depends upon. You can target a very specific group or multiple groups if they are interrelated. So mostly it will be helpful for like, you know, if you are talking of how many number of people use a specific brand of mobile phone, that could go for a large group. But if you are talking of how many number of people utilize a specific mobile phone like Samsung or Redmi, you will be then targeting some specific group of people who have bought it. 
Traditionally, the survey research earlier was done face to face or via phone calls. But now with the development of Internet methods, emails, social medias and online mediums all are very useful and helpful for doing the survey research. Then there are two kinds of survey research which are done. One are cross sectional surveys and other are longitudinal surveys. The cross sectional surveys are observational surveys wherein which the researcher collects data only for one defined time point. You don't go beyond that. Like he collects the data only for two months and then he stops the research. Data gathered in this type of survey he, uh, will, what you call, is only for limited time point and you are considering the variables only in that time point for that particular research. They are very popular in retail and healthcare industries. Information is gathered without modifying any party, uh, parameters in the variable ecosystem. So you don't modify any variables. You just look at the variables, how they are varying for a defined time point. Now, cross-sectional survey research method, you can use it for multiple samples for analysis and you can compare them together as such. But however, there are certain disadvantages with it, which includes because it's only for one time point and that you are not altering the variables, you might not get out accurate results. Then you have longitudinal surveys. When we say longitudinal surveys, they are done over a time. Unlike cross-sectional, you have a large number of points across time wherein which you do it. It involves large number of variables and varying the variables. So when you are doing for multiple time points, like few months, two months, four months, six months, a year and all, you can vary one, one variable at a time and you can study and see how it is different. They are highly applied in the field of medicine and applied sciences. If you want to study the sequence of events and the effect it has, then longitudinal surveys are the best kind of survey research which you can do. That gets us to the second one, which is correlational research. When you say correlational research, you, as the name says, you are trying to study the effect of uh, a, a specific parameter uh, means effect on the parameter from two specific variables. It's a relationship between two closely knit entities and how it impacts one another. Researchers use this kind of quantitative research design in mathematical analysis, many of the cases. Patterns, relationships and trends between variables are concluded because they exist with the original setup. You pick up any two variables and you fix all remaining variables and you study them. Researcher tends to manipulate one of the variables to attain the design results. So many of the cases, when you are doing this kind of a research, you could have one dependent variable and one independent variable. The independent variable might not, you know, it doesn't affect it, but the dependent one, you're looking for how it affects. Now, uh, correlational research usually cannot be used to make definitive conclusions because here you don't know whether really those two variables have any effect or not. You are just thinking there is an effect and you're going ahead, but you are not considering other variables into feature as such. Yes, so as it is said, it is not mandatory that the variables are in sync and they are interrelated. For example, the relationship between stress and depression. Well, you can have, you might not have, in many cases, it's correlatable, but it might not be also. The equation between fame and money and the relationship between activities in a third grade class and its students, these are like, they are broader questions and hence you have multiple variables here, but you're not considering them. So it is just a correlational part and it has nothing to do beyond that. Then you come to casual comparative research. This research method mainly uh, depends on the factor of comparison. Now, it's a kind of quantitative research wherein which you are trying to look at cause effect equation, meaning you are trying to change one variable and you are trying to look for effect of the change. The independent variable is established but is not manipulated. So you have an independent variable and you have a dependent variable. So you don't modify the independent variable, you modify the dependent one and see if there is an effect. Casual comparative research is not restricted to statistical analysis of two variables, but you can ex uh, go for doing it for multiple variables or groups. 
which are highly related and they fall in the same category. Now, this research is conducted irrespective of the type of relation that exists between two or more variables. But since they all are interconnected to the same pattern or to the same topic, so it really doesn't matter. Statistical analysis is used to distinctively present the outcome obtained using this method. Examples of casual comparative research questions include the impact of drugs on a teenager. When you are saying impact of drugs on a teenager, the teenager, not necessarily that all the teenagers take drugs. Some might not take, some might take. So you are not looking at all those aspects. You, are, you might have multiple variables here. You are just trying to look, connecting them to see if it is. But some of the variables might not be related also. The effect of good education on a freshman or the effect of substantial food provision in villages of Africa. Some of the villages might not need food provision because they are self-reliant also. So these are the points which you might not be considering and working it out as such when you are saying that, you know, it is in this way. Then you come to experimental research. As the name itself suggests, it is by doing experiment. Analysis is done based on a hypothesis you make the hypothesis and you try to prove whether it is correct or wrong this research method is usually in, used in natural sciences there can be multiple theories in the experimental research and the theory is a statement which fits your research question and you try to answer whether it is a yes or it is a no now after establishing the statement or the research hypothesis, you make efforts to prove whether it is valid or invalid. Now, this kind of research is highly used in life sciences and in social sciences because they are various statements which are required to be proved right or wrong. Traditional research methods are more effective than modern techniques in experimental research. And here, for example, systematic teaching schedules help children to find who find it hard to cope with the course so here you need to do experimental research because some of the children who can't easily cope up with the course there you have to do systematic teaching is it true then you pick participants then you do the experiment that's the hypothesis you try to prove it is a boon to have a responsible nursing staff for ailing parents here again, you have to do a, a, conduct a proper experiment here and come back whether if this hypothesis is correct or is not correct. Now, the way by which you do data analysis and sampling in quantitative is slightly different and that's what has been put forth here. There are two arms of it. You do a probability sampling method or you do a non-probability sampling method. The probability sampling could be simple random sampling that means you just randomly pick up or it could be a cluster or you do systematic or you layer already the participants and you do it. In non-probability sampling, you can have convenience based on how you want it or it could be judgmental or it is snowball sampling or you have what is called as quota sampling. So we will just look up at what each of these are and how they are here as you can see here. Now simple chosen randomly from a population equal possibility of being selected you have so now systematic means you are based on the question you are selecting the population sample is at regular intervals until the sample size is reached so here you are collecting based on the sample size so you might not have equal distribution of what you want stratified is in layers as it says population grouped by a characteristic like you are doing based on male or female sex or inpatient outpatient sample randomly and equally from groups it avoids unequal representation or bias quota is stratified with specific numbers like okay this much group is enough for in the stratification then it becomes quoted, quoted or quota then you have what is called as cluster. Cluster is like focus group, population divided into subpopulations or clusters. You randomly select clusters as needed, include all individuals in the selected cluster. Then convenience is based on your convenience or sometimes it's also based on availability or presence of the specific individual. Purposive or theoretical, you select subjects with specific traits like experienced, inexperienced, preferred methods for qualitative research. 
it's poorly generalized in quantitative. There's a lot of bias here because it depends on how you do it. Snowballing is subjects. You What you do here is you select some subjects, then you ask subjects to select other subjects. And then volunteering is canvassing or editizing for subjects, inviting people to fill out a questionnaire. These are the various sampling methods which exist or which are there as such and which are used. Any one of this could be followed and done. Now, the data collection methods when you come to are different and where we discuss about that was about the various methods to be followed for sampling. This is for data collection. A survey is the most common way by which you do it. It's defined as a research method used for collecting data from a predefined group of respondents to gain information and insights on various topics of interest. Here, when you are doing survey for quantitative research, it's a closed end question has to be used. It can be a specific population or a mix of population. You can have multiple choice questions here, uh, which can be answered or they could be single ones also. So like, for example, you have semantic differential scale questions or rating scale. So like you can give questions where in which you can ask the respondents to rate on a scale of one to 10. And so you go based on the rating and you analyze it and uh, related such aspects. Then survey distribution process for data collection could be very different. Some of the most commonly used methods include email, embedded surveys on websites, social distribution, QR codes, SMS, or apps, which you can download and use it for the survey models. Now, having said that, what are the data analysis methods that you have? After you collect the raw data, there has to be analysis of this data so that you can do statistical interference. So it's important to relate the results to the objective of research and establish that as statistical relevance of results. Now, there are standard statistical pa uh, packages available to do this, which include SWOT, conjoint, cross tabulation and others. So you quantitate data based on those and then you get out with what you want. Now, SWOT analysis is the one. SWOT analysis stands for strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis. This is one of the most widely used one in most of the research ones. It, it organizations use this to evaluate their performance internally and externally to develop effective strategies for improvement. Conjoint analysis is market analysis method to learn how individuals make complicated decisions while purchasing how they make a decision. So to know it, you do a conjoint analysis. So trade-offs are involved in the daily activities of an individual and all these trade-offs, trade-offs meaning the way he thinks, the way he, you know, evaluates the whole process. You have to mix based on those, only you have to... <clears throat> put forth uh, your particular analysis. So you use conjoint analysis there. Then cross tabulation. When you say cross tabulation, you try to establish relationships, patterns and trends within various parameters of the research study. So this you can do it based on the preliminary statistical market analysis methods that you have. You try to cross tabulate the data and see how it goes. Turf analysis is totally unduplicated reach and frequency analysis. It is executed in situations where you have both favorable and unfavorable communication. So you have got a specific amount of favorable communications, uh, which could be useful for you and you have unfavorable. And so you can't decide how to analyze. You can use turf. It's used for understanding the potential of a target market, which is aptly said here. Then. Secondary quantitative research methods. When we talk of secondary quantitative research methods, it means you already have data available and you are using that data for analysis. Existing data is summarized and collated to increase the overall effectiveness. This research method involves the collection of quantitative data from existing data sources. Data available on internet, government and non-government sources, public libraries, educational institutions, or any other con con commercial sources. You collect from there and you utilize this data and you use it for quantitation part. So that is secondary quantitative methods for analysis. Now, having said it, what are the characteristics of a good quantitative research? One, 
it is structured you use structured tools for the data analysis to do you use methods which are validated and you utilize them in a proper manner surveys polls or questionnaires are used to gather quantitative data then sample size you for quantitative research you need a significant sample size because for doing effective statistical analysis the sample size matters then close ended questions so which means that your question has to be very specific and meeting the objective prior studies should have been done before you address the question and it should come out based on it then quantitative data should be there in the forms of tables charts graphs or any other non numerical forms then a uh, generalization of results has to be there to tell whether it has me met the hypothesis or it has not met the hypothesis so th those are the qualities of a uh, good quantitative research now having said that we come to methodologies for mixed research <clears throat> now when you are doing mixed research it could be done in any ways first you select the participants and conduct focus groups you analyze the qualitative data that is the seed for quantitative data then you analyze it and you merge both of them together over a time period which you mentioned clearly methodology for mixed research examples of such include combining qualitative and quantitative methodologies in research on teachers life's work and effectiveness here you go for both and then you mix them close and open ended question tools in telephone survey about the good teacher or emotions and change during professional development for teachers a mixed method study so such specific topics if you select and you're working on you have to mix but it's important that you know how to mix them together as such now stages in mixed method research when you talk of first you decide the topic you decide the purpose for doing the topic then you describe the phenomena or problem of the research and you have to justify how you are going to do the mixed method you give the research question and you give what answer you get and you justify here why only mixed methods will answer the question and why not anything else and when you are saying you are mixing it you have to tell at which stage are you mixing it are you mixing at the data collection stage or data analysis stage or final interpretation stage all the details have to be given uh, all the participants have to remember that when it is a mixed method the justification has to be very accurate and clear otherwise it shall not be accepted at all now here is the one example of a flow chart quantitative data collection and analysis in the form of questionnaires then you follow up with qualitative data collection and analysis in form of focus group discussions and interviews and you interpret it finally now the data analysis when you do for mixed research could go in any way you can do the data collection focus grouped in depth interviews analyze it or you can do data collection for a prospective cohort study you analyze it you mix both and you integrate the results or you integrate the results here and you finally interpret it it doesn't matter irrespective of however it is as long as the mixed method strategy is properly justified you do not have issues with it then how do you evaluate the mixed method strategy you describe that mixed method is the best approach to answer you incorporate both qualitative and quantitative data collections you use a rigorous methods of screening for justifying this you provide a diagram of procedures which clarifies the timing priority and mixing and you signal to the reader that study is using mixed methods with that you have a very clear cut idea as how you can do it out now having said it we come to the aspect of hypothesis it's important to propose the hypothesis without which you can't do the methodology or even the search per se the characteristics of hypothesis include it is something which you can validate so you is capable of verification it is something which is uh, related to the existing body of knowledge it should be precise simple and specific in nature as such 
then there are different kinds of hypothesis the first one is alternate hypothesis alternate hypothesis meaning you propose a hypothesis and you get an answer for it which is in favor of it then that is alternate alternate hypothesis states that there's a relationship between two variables being studied it states that the results are not due to chance and that they are significant in terms of supporting the theory a null hypothesis is where the results do not match your hypothesis so it is null or void it states results are yeah so when you propose a null hypothesis it is telling the fact that results are not obtained just by chance but they are uh, they are obtained by logical manner but they don't hold any significance with the idea being investigated then non directional hypothesis it's a two-tailed non-directional hypothesis predicts that independent variable will have an effect on dependent variable but in what is the direction in which it has effect is not specified for example there will be a difference in how many number or how many numbers are correctly recalled by children and adults now you're just trying to tell how many but you are not telling exactly whether adults will correctly recall or not so there's no direction directional hypothesis the nature of effect uh, and the, it predicts the nature of effect of independent variable on the dependent variable like adults will correctly recall more words than children that's far more specific when you say it out then evaluation and justification of methodology is very important now your methodology should make a case as why you choose it it should tell why other methods were not valid and why only these methods are suitable it should give a justification as how approach contributes to the knowledge or understanding if you have limitations or weaknesses you must be in a position to justify it very clearly that these are the various features which have to be evaluated when you are doing justification for the methodology then the tips for writing a strong methodology include don't just describe the methods you have to give clear cut idea of overall blueprint focus on your objectives and tell why your research was conducted in a proper justifiable manner the methodology section should give very clear idea as why your methods suit your objectives you don't need to compare with other methods you need to convince the reader that you choose the best possible approach and throughout the section you relate your choices back to central purpose of your dissertation then cite the relevant sources your methodology can be strengthened by reference to existing research confirm that you are doing everything in the ethical manner and you have evaluated everything properly show that you took a novel methodological approach to address the gap in literature and you have to write for the audience and not for yourself so that it will be working it out you should give sufficient information but you don't give too much if you are using methods that are standard for your discipline you probably don't need to give lot of background but if it is a new one you give appropriate background to justify it out then in either case the methodology should be clear well structured that it makes a argument for your approach you discuss the obstacles if you have encountered obstacles how you have overcome them even that you have to mention show how you minimize the impact of any unexpected obstacles and demonstrate that your research has been done in the best rigorous possible manner now uh, having said that most frequently asked questions on methods and methodology is what you i have put forth here to make it simple what is the difference between method and methodology as i have said method is a subsection of methodology but it is not complete you describe the instruments techniques analysis and others methodology is a blueprint of your research that you do then in short scientific papers where the aim is to report the findings of a specific study you might simply describe what you did in a method section in thesis or dissertation uh, you will include a methodology section so papers usually research papers don't have methodology section it's only methods it's a thesis which has it then where does methodology section come in a research paper in a scientific paper it usually comes after introduction and before results 
However, it's not methodology, it is methods. Depending on the length and type of document, you might also include a literature review or a theoretical framework before methodology, which is apt when you are doing thesis. What is the difference between qualitative and quantitative methods? Quantitative research deals with numbers and stats, whereas qualitative research deals with words and meanings. Quantitative methods allow you to systematically measure variables and test hypotheses, whereas qualitative is just exploratory in nature. What is a sampling? As it is said, sample is a subset of individuals from a larger population. Sampling means selecting the group that you will actually collect data from in your research. In statistics, sampling allows you to test the hypothesis clearly. So having said that, um, I would uh, say that with this, we almost we have come to end of this webinar. Now, in case if you have any queries or any related doubts, you can write to us and we are here to help you out with many of the aspects. The WhatsApp number and contact details are shared on the screen. Now, we are available for live question answer session on today's research methods and research methodology webinar. So please post your questions and I'm here to help you out. So the, for all the participants, the, uh, the question answer session is open. Please go ahead and post your questions. I'm here to help you out. Okay, Sudhakar has a question. Statistically insignificant correlation between variables and thus leading to a null hypothesis is dependent on the sample size and what is the minimum sample size or number of observations in a cross-sectional data collection. Now, when you are doing a cross-sectional data collection, since you are saying that the correlation is insignificant because your sample size was less, it's always good that if you have a larger sample size, because it's quantitative, if you can have at least 100 of them, it will be good to begin with. If you can have more, it is great to do and work out. Dr. Abdul Aziz Hamido Tafa says, sir, what may be the key trick to set up good hypothesis? The key trick for a good hypothesis depends on how good is your question. It depends on how good is your question. Now, how have you framed your research question for writing the hypothesis? If your research question is good, then automatically your hypothesis also will be good. Muhammad Rafi says, could I get the recorded material of this webinar? Yeah, sure, you can get it and Tejas, we can help you out with it. Parthibani says, could you please give an example for hypothesis? Now, there are a couple of examples which we have put here. The effect of drugs on teenagers, if you are looking at it. You have to look at multiple variables and you have to work out in many of the ways. So that is one way by which you look at it. You try to answer the question. That's your hypothesis. If it works, yes. If it is no, it is no. Subhash CK says, I'm conducting a mixed method research part. For qualitative part, I'm doing a phenomenology and quantitative design a survey research is used. Do I need a theoretical framework or is it suitable to combine them? How do we approach? Subhash, you can do theoretical framework individually for each that will justify your work and then later you can club both also so you present clubbed one first and if the reviewers are not happy for your thesis then you can present individual one in any ways a theoretical framework will be essential for your work you can put in either clubbed or sing i would say clubbed will be more favorable than single one uh, Sudhakar has a question, sir, as per reports, despite a vast and well-developed road network and ease of last mile connectivity in road travel, most casualties occur due to road accidents, Dis despite the safe and fast travel and time saving and charges are coming down. Why, sir, travel is not preferred in India? Is it because of additional time wasted in reaching airport? <laughs> yes, Sudhakar, it is true because most of the cities, the traffic is so much that by the time you reach airport, you are exhausted. What is the broad type research in this case? Okay, one way by which you can do this research 
one variable is people are just fed up of traveling to airport because of so much of traffic so look at traffic congestion as one variable and consumer satisfaction so that will help you to understand what's going on explanatory and quantitative thanks now when you are doing exp uh, yeah, i think both explanatory is quantitative research so when you are doing this you can have a large number of participants take participants who are driving on their own to the airport and collect their satisfaction survey based on traffic congestion based on pollution and other aspects and you will know satyavir says please also send voice recordings which can be listened repeatedly over mobile and easy to repeat ah that they just we can look at it Uh, at many places, casual is written in place of casual, and also many mistakes and mismatch of speech and slide contents. Satyavir, uh, thanks for letting us know. We will look at it because many a times it's the grammatical error which get we automatically correct it out. But if there were any such mistakes, we'll see. And regarding mismatch of speech and slide contents, see the slides we we put forth we don't read the slides we try to explain the slide so sometimes you might have got content from here to there you know what uh, overlapping so that should not be a problem if there were any such we will look at the mistakes and we will get back to you thanks for letting us know bilal ahmed says doctor please go uh, go through some light on fuzzy delphi technique uh, bilal unfortunately i am also not good at it i have to look at it maybe then i can answer you back that sajan pravina says can we have a separate webinar for sampling technique thanks for letting us know that sages we will look at it and if it is then we will work it out sudhakar says sir with regard to correlational research say for a well established correlation like travel frequency of people in a year is dependent on per capita income well that is true sudhakar you could always use it if a similar study is done in a different country or a region can it be called a research on a new topic oh no, yeah you can call it because if you are doing in india it is one thing if you are doing outside say in a, a us or in saudi it will be a new topic though the topic is same the country has changed so it will be a different perspective of the research which is still valid um mm. Vinita Ramnath Pai says, "Is it casual comparative or what is a is that causal comparative research?" Uh, thanks, Vinita. We will look at it. I think in most of the cases, it is a self correction which comes where it would have corrected it out for the grammar, you know, corrections as such. We will look at it, and if there is a mistake, we will definitely correct it out. Uh, to all the participants, if you have found any such mistake, it would be an auto error correction, which happens when we are making the slides. We will ensure that you know next time onwards we wouldn't repeat it. Thanks to all the participants, Vinita and even other an, another guy who mentioned it, we will ensure that we will work on it. Thanks so much. Buhari says, "Can you explain how to code interview responses and how to analyze the responses?" Now, how to code inter uh, review? How to code means what exactly are you looking for? That is the point which we uh, is important, Buhari here. So, what is what is that you are looking at, and how exactly is that? you want to grade it for example interview responses if you want that the participants to say yes or you want participants to say no based on that you go ahead and you grade it out abdul salam ahmed says what do you mean by participant recruitment and how to approach participants in quantitative research absolutely not a problem what do you mean by participant approach is like for example as i have said you are looking at a strategy of how the drugs behave in a market scenario when you release a new drug so you already have existing customers approach them with a survey form and you have new customers approach them with a survey form and use both of them which could be helpful and you do it you approach the customers take their informed consent if they are not interested then you don't include them that's it Felix Mutau says the impact of retrenchment on non-surviving employees. A case study of scorpion zinc mine. What could be the output of topic? Felix, what does the word retrenchment mean? Can you explain it to us? Then we will say because I believe that you are talking of some harmful effect 
that uh, a case study of scorpion zinc mine, you are talking of some harmful effect of the victim when he's working in the zinc mine. So you could mostly talk about the output in terms of what is the harm that is caused and how it is caused. Ranjit Thakur says, which can be other methods of data collection in my case. Uh, what exactly is your case, Ranjit? If you have already posted earlier, let me look at it. Uh, okay, so there could be several methods of data collection. Well, you look at whichever is the best one and you can see it. If you still have issues, you can ask us. Felix, if retrenchment means retirement, you mean to say the impact of retirement on non-surviving employees. Oh, a case study of scorpion zinc mine. Retirement of non-surviving employees. I, I couldn't get your topic because if he is not surviving, what would be the impact of retirement? I couldn't get your question. If you can pose it in a much easier language, which I can get, maybe I can tell you because I'm not understanding. If he is non-surviving, then how can retrenchment be calculated? Please, or you, uh, you come back to us with your specific question and we'll address it back to you. San uh, Sandeep Sharma says, what about my inquiry? So what was your inquiry, Sandeep? Let me look at it. I am uh, not getting it here. If you can post it again, I will work it out. Uh, uh, Sneha R says, Sir, kindly arrange a webinar on solved numericals. Well, you just write to the research graduate management team and they will see the feasibility of it, Sneha. Tinikyo says, are the methods applicable to legal research? Today's webinar was on general one. I'm not focusing on any specific field, so it should still be applicable. Abdul Salam Ahmad says, relation to qualitative, how will the data be verified or member jicked? You can always verify the data. You collect it, take the recordings and see if it is valid or not. That will help you. Nazim Banu says, what statistical analysis is suitable for rating scale questionnaire? You don't need a statistical analysis there. You are having a scaled questionnaire and you can use this scaled questionnaire for saying yes or no. So you could make it qualitative. If you want to have it quantitative, then you have to see how many respondents are giving in the scaled questionnaire a yes or a no. Um, Amal says, can you please organize a webinar on blockchain? Now, that's a specific topic, but you write to the management and we'll see how to do it. MIR says, my data comprises of both types of responses. Yes, no, and satisfactory, unsatisfactory. How should we interpret it numerically or qualitatively? Now, if it is qualitative, then it's easy. Then you see whether the overall trend is yes or no, or it's satisfactory or unsatisfactory. If it is quantitative or numerical, you take the total number of responses and you make the statistical charts. How many are yes, how many are no, how many are satisfactory and how many are unsatisfactory. And then see how you can reach it. Who says, thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Daniel. This is using in vivo. Uh, we have to look at it even. I'm not sure of. And if you have any such, I'm sure that you might not have it free. So we have to look at it for that. Even I'm not sure of it, Akhil. 
Rajarat, uh, Rajaratnam Surya Kumar says, when it comes sampling, how we know whether the same size is significant? Now, for statistical significance, larger the sample size, the better it is. If you are doing, uh, considering for significance, the same sample size, start with the sample size, which is bigger and not small. Then uh, Aditya Kumar Thakur says, Sir, thanks for the valuable session. My one query is related with analysis. I was doing structural equation modeling. My question is if structural relationship values of dependent to independent diagram showing negative. I mean, it's a negative value. This means independent variable is negatively affecting dependent. So can we convert into positive relation by any other method? Uh, even I don't know, because if it is showing that it negatively affects, how would you convert it into positive? Is it possible that you can consider any other variable as independent variable rather than this? If you can do it, it does it help? Just look at it. Now, MIR says, I didn't understand what you meant by data is analyzed by themes from descriptions by informants. Yeah, themes is thematic analysis is by looking for patterns. Descriptions you are collecting from informants either in the form of recordings or in any other form. Collect the recordings, play over and see if you get concurrent themes which are underlying in that. So it will be useful. Ranjit Thakur says, in case of descriptive case study research, can I collect data through five point liker? You could do it. It should not be a problem. Jyoti says, what is good sample size for qualitative research? The higher it is, the better. If you can have 50 to 100, like it is good. Bilal Ahmed Bhatt says, sir, do we get the recording? Yes, they, we will provide you with the recording. Feba Anna John says, very informative session. Thanks. Thanks, Feba. Uh, Dr. Uh, Abdul Aziz Hamid Tofa, uh, Tafa says, is there any threshold as sample size that can widely be accepted by most journals? There is no threshold, but I think minimum is like 50 at least. If you go above that, it is good. Ninad Pradeep Rao says, I'm doing research in commerce and management. Which method is helpful? Well, what is the research you are doing? We need to know. Then we can tell you that. Then uh, MIR says, what is case study? Case study is you are picking up an individual specific case and analyzing that. Or you are picking up related cases and then you are analyzing it. Qualitative or quantitative, any of them work. Ashok says, I request for paper editing and publication quotation about one month passed and I communicated many times, but I didn't get it. Uh, Tejasvi, can you just look at this and see what he wants? Nasim says, in exploratory survey using interview schedule is justified or not? It is justified, Nasim. There is no problem. Raja Ratnam says, if we adopt convenience sampling, can still use parametric analysis if data is normally distributed. Well, that is too specific that you have asked, but uh, have you tried it out already? If it is making sense, you can use it. Otherwise, you have to see what you can do. Um, Feba Anna John says, if we once find our that hypothesis that we have made was outdated, what should we do? Upgrade your hypothesis by changing the research problem. You go through more literature, cover it and get it done. Sajan Praveena Gunaratna says, I would be very grateful if you could kindly arrange a webinar on sampling techniques. Uh, well, please pro pro uh, pass it on to our uh, web team and uh, our management team. They will help. They'll tell you whether it's possible or not. Dr. Neera says, what's the difference between research question and hypothesis? Research question is what you frame based on literature. Hypothesis is you try to mention, I'm doing this and what is the probable outcome of this? Farhad says, many thanks to you, sir, and I have learned a lot of things. Can you have both research questions and hypothesis in same time? If so, in what research? You can have it, but they will be different as how I said. Uh, how do I get old research papers? Sandeep says, old research papers, you can't get them. They are before 1980s, but it doesn't really matter as such. You can always get them out and you can work it out. Satyavir says, can you please guide on Sample size for quote uh, quantitative research of an organization of 80,000 people. Oh, you have a huge sample size. So you pick up based on what your topic you want and take at least 
500 to 1000 people and you can work it out. So I would say to all the participants that we are about to end the session now. So if you have any of your questions that have not been answered and that has not happened, please post to us or write to us and we will answer back to you. Uh, so with that, we end the question answer session. The participation certificate will be emailed to you by 5 p.m. tomorrow. You will get a feedback form at 2.45 p.m. You will get free bonus at 3.15 p.m. You will get recording of the webinar at 3.30 p.m. You will get the PPT of webinar at 3.45. Please check your emails and mark our emails so that you don't miss any important updates at any time. Then... Uh, thanks for attending the webinar and we'll surely see you back at the next webinar. Now, these are the references which have been put forth as such. Now, having said that, uh, let me tell you one thing that all the participants, if in case we have missed your questions, we will be here definitely to take care of it. So I think I have still another two to three minutes time. So I'll try to answer some more questions of the participants and then I will be like logging out from the session. Sandeep Sharma says, I'm so confused how to choose my PhD topic. I tried in fractional differential equation. You send us what you want and how you want and maybe we can help you out. Now, Jyoti says, what's a good sample size for a qualitative research using one to one interview method, maybe 50 to 100. Uh, Ninad Pradipra says, how to, read, how to define null hypothesis? A null hypothesis is null, meaning your hypothesis and observed outcome don't match. That's null hypothesis. Then uh, uh, MIR says, do exploratory research have hypothesis? Yes, any research has hypothesis. Nazim Bano says, what statistical analysis is suitable for rating scale questionnaire? Minimum, how many samples are needed for questionnaire sample? So you need at least 50 to 100 and uh, that we have to look for questionnaire what will be useful and you have to look at it and say it out. Farhad says, many, many thanks. Can we have both research questions and hypothesis in same time? Yes, but they will delineate as I answered earlier. Mm, is it okay to have open-ended question and closed-ended questionnaire, Nazim? Nazim says that. But that is contradictory. If you are having a closed-ended questionnaire, how can you have open-ended questions? Maybe you can fit in some, but I don't know if that will be logical. Mm. Nazim says, in exploratory survey using interview schedule, is it justified or not? Uh, it is justified and you could go ahead and do it. So, uh, Abdul Asam Ahmed says, average time for quantitative and qualitative data collection. Well, that will depend upon. You should be done within few months time and that should be okay. Then... Kuljit Singh says, I am taking your webinar in future. Thanks. That is what we expect to have more people. And uh, okay, fine. That Now that we are left with very short time, a huge thanks to all the people for attending the webinar. We are happy to have you as our participants for today's webinar. If still there are any doubts or any related ones you have, you please contact us back and we will answer it to you. Please follow our, uh, what do you call, emails regularly and we send because for the future webinars that we conduct, we will be there to help you out and work it out as such. Uh, so having said that, a huge round of thanks to all the people. See you back in the next webinar. Thanks for attending the webinar.